All right. So yeah, welcome to yet another talk on critical perspectives on technology. And this lecture series is part of my research project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies in interaction design. My name is Katja Spiel, and I'm a Hertha Fernberg's postdoctoral scholar at TU Wien, where I research marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. My pronouns are they, them, and my sign name is uh, I will uh, post again um, the access uh, slides and, and notes that Christina provided us uh, for us. And if you have any further access needs, please let me know. I will do my best to accommodate them. Starting with next week's, no, not next week's, but starting with the next lecture, we're also going to have Austrian Sign Language Interpretation. But today you are here to hear from Christina. As a designer and qualitative researcher, Dr. Christina Harrington focuses on understanding and conceptualizing technology experiences that support health and racial equity among marginalized groups. Her research as the director of the Equity and Health Innovations Design Research Lab explores ways to employ design as a catalyst for health equity and socially responsible technology experiences. She explores concepts such as health, social acceptance, and collectivism through community-based participatory design and co-creation, engaging, engaging critical design and socio-technical computing. Second. So, um, through participatory research methods, she explores constructs of empowerment and access in design among vulnerable communities that have been marginalized along multiple dimensions of identity, age, race, ethnicity, income, or class, and or class, I assume. Uh, Dr. Harrington is an assistant professor in the College of Computing and Digital Media at DePaul University and received her PhD from Georgia Tech's College of Design. The presentation is titled, The Future is Collectivism, Exploring Technology Co-Design from a Lens of Critical Design. So you can ask, questions during and after the presentation in the chat window or however Christina tells you. And afterwards, we will hopefully be uh, all in discussion, uh, which is then hopefully led by Nana Kiseva Dankwa, who is a PhD candidate in computer science at the University of Kassel. She has major interest in exploring participatory design methods that influence non-bias in technology innovation. And she's also interested in the themes of race, culture, as well as gender and diversity and its relationship with cooperative, cooperative collaboration and technology innovation. Her previous research work focused on co-creation techniques and sustainability in student living spaces and understanding user motivations for playing location-based games. But for now, Christina, take it away. Thank you so much, Katja. Um, yeah, so, as Katya mentioned, I am Christina Harrington, um, and I will be talking about um, some of the work that I've been doing in this area of um, collectivism and speculative design and um, understanding critical design or, or through a lens of, of critical design, um, really understanding how we can improve the access of design and inclusion in design. Um, as mentioned, uh, I want this to be a little bit more uh, informal. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, give the talk. But if there's questions that you would like to throw up in the chat, um, I'll try to see them and I'll try to um, uh, respond to them uh, as I'm speaking. Uh, if there's something that I'll get to a little later um, throughout the course of the talk, I'll just let that be known that that the answer to that question is is coming up. And I apologize in advance for my dog. Um, she becomes very adventurous whenever she sees me on Zoom because she feels like I'm not giving her attention. Um, so as mentioned, uh, I am a designer, uh, a qualitative researcher, um, a sci-fi enthusiast, um, and a DIY crafter. Um, I have studied all things design for over a decade now, um, and my research looks at how we consider aspects of people's identity and the tools and environments that we create. Um, I focus on who is being considered when we conceptualize these tools and systems and how we can consider the needs of certain communities. 
And I'm hoping that this talk will help to share some of these insights about my interest in design um, and how they intersect with health and racial equity um, to you know, kind of promote thinking about who we consider when we conceptualize tools for the future. Um, I, I always like to give a little bit of a background about myself because my background is so interdisciplinary and I find that sometimes um, students and younger researchers are curious uh, about like how to get to how some of us get to, to certain journeys uh, or some, some of us get to where we are um, in, our, in our journey. Um, so while I am currently an assistant professor in the School of Design, um, which is housed in the College of Computing and Digital Media at DePaul, I have also had experience working in various areas of human factors and user experience design. Um, and so along with my background in engineering and, and industrial design, this has kind of shaped my perspective on inclusive interaction design uh, and human computer interaction. Uh, so I'll, I'll be talking about my work today uh, in, in five kind of phases. Um, so I'll give a background of who I am as a researcher, um, as well as the motivation to my work, uh, my research approach, uh, and then talk about one particular project, and then share some of the ongoing work um, that I have going on in the Equity and Health Innovations Lab. So my research explores the relationship between design and health and racial equity. Um, and when we think about approaching equity from the lens of interaction design, we, we actually position design as a tool to elicit change towards more positive health outcomes and societal outcomes. Um, and this actually has great meaning for the ways that people access information, the inclusion in that access, um, how people experience tools and digital resources that are meant to support and enhance overall well being, um, as well as the ways that we engage certain communities in designing for the future. Uh, my work in the design space kind of has two major goals, um, and the first being to facilitate equity and in health information access and tools for aging in place among groups of older adults that are often forgotten and, and typically neglected when we think about innovative health interventions. Um, and the second being to consider inclusivity and equity in which groups have access to participate in design. So thinking about kind of that first goal, um, much of my previous work has looked at the ways that older adults and people with disabilities and impairments interact with technology, examining everything from types of use to impact of technology on daily life, um, experiences with gestures and interfaces. For example, the image in this slide um, depicts an older gentleman um, with his hand reached out to a television screen um, that is showing uh, an, an exer game or an exercise video game on the Xbox Connect. Um, and this was actually a study that we did to look at understanding older adults' perceptions of and attitudes towards exercise video games and, uh, and kind of allowing them to be more physically active within the home. Um, and so this is one of the ways that we kind of look at, well, how can everyday technologies support um, individuals, although the, that, that might not have been the original intent of the technology, um, we actually found that uh, extra games do have viable potential to increase physical activity in the home, but as you can probably imagine, usability is a concern. Um, understanding how to interact with gestures was a concern among this group. More recently, I've begun to focus specifically on how do we consider the lived experiences of those in Black and Brown communities, because in many instances, when it comes to health, um, or societal concerns, or even just design in general, these communities are typically left behind. Um, and all of this has um, drawn on the premise that design can be a catalyst for social change um, for individuals that are often marginalized or disenfranchised. Um, and design well serves the current challenge that we face of health and racial equity. Uh, this is an area that uh, needs our attention now more than ever because of the ways that health inequities plague certain communities within the United States um, and what this means for quality of life and expected lifespan. We know that the healthcare system in the United States has failed poor black and brown folks. And we know that not only is this by design, but that design is also an approach to circumvent this. 
Um, more specifically, ethnic minorities and lower income individuals experience health disparities at a much larger rate than that of the population majority, but are often focused on much less in the decision of how technology solutions um, to address health are conceptualized. Um, and so I also just wanna contextualize who is meant by the term marginalized, um, because I know that, that this is a term that we see a lot within the HCI and design and computing um, literature. Um, and specifically with my research, um, I, I use the definition of marginalized that, that includes those who have been disenfranchised and historically oppressed in the United States due to race, class, ability, sexual orientation or identity or citizenship. Um, and within this definition, uh, my research considers the forgotten middle or older ethnic minorities that also experience poverty in our country. Um, and so I focus here and specifically identify uh, these individuals as being black and brown communities because oftentimes, even when we're talking about inclusion in tech or in design, black and Hispanic communities are neglected or further marginalized. Um, we, when we think about considering inclusion and equity and access to things like information and digital spaces, um, it, it's important because black and brown elders, black and brown um, uh, disabled individuals, um, various communities are still disproportionately impacted by things like the digital divide. Um, and so while many of these populations can tend to grow, uh, continue to grow, uh, Black and Hispanic elders who sit at or below the poverty line are often not proportionately present in our research. Um, in recent years, we've seen an influx in both the ubiquity and pervasiveness of information technologies as a prominent approach to seeking health information in the home and to maintaining one's health in the home, um, which has you know, various benefits. But we've also began to learn how much access is an, act, is, is, is an issue and, and um, how many people do not have access um, to these informations or these technologies, um, which starts to bring about conversations about why constructs like literacy and proficiency um, are incredibly relevant to the field of HCI and computing. So much of my previous work has looked at how we engage many of these communities in conceptualizing tools to support their wellness and how our methods can be more inclusive, um, the design methods being um, more accessible themselves, um, which kind of brings about this, this second interest, or excuse me, or the interest in my second research goal, which is considering who has access to design. This is an area that I've began to explore um, in various different uh, projects. And I've, bet, I've begun to consider how we best engage historically disenfranchised groups in collaboratively considering um, their futures, whether that includes technology or not, um, and it, whether that be in the area of health and well being or the futures of neighborhoods, or even in the design practice itself. Um, so through a lot of the previous studies that I've done, I've been able to identify some of the benefits of approaching design through community-based collectivism. And this concept of who gets to participate in design and collective futuring um, is, is, you know, kind of something that I've become really passionate about. Um, and so I'll, I'm gonna focus on that for the remainder of this, this presentation. When I speak about futuring and design, uh, I'm referring to methods of speculation or radical co-design, which consider alternatives of desirable and undesirable worlds by speculating to immediate or distant futures. Um, even with this method being considered a radical approach to considering um, the future of technology systems, the future of environments, um, the future of just our everyday, we still have to ask who is being included in these areas of design. And so I want to pro provide a bit of um, motivation to, in, in addressing that question um, to the importance of why this, this area is so important, um, why this area of who is included in tech futures, and why elements of collectivism and speculation might be an approach that deserves our attention. 
Um, one of the major challenges with regards to inclusion in the tech space um, is this concept of the digital divide. And I mentioned this before, and for those who are not familiar, um, the digital divide basically situates um, you know, us thinking about um, there being a divide between who has access to technology and who doesn't. Um, stating that there are various constructs that kind of um, uh, uh, are, are barriers to certain individuals um, being able to engage with technology um, as much as they they might want. Um, and, and when we think about this in terms of tech research, it also calls for us to consider um, how we then start to label certain individuals as being technology proficient um, and who, who isn't technology proficient. Um, and this calls me to think about a perspective that Anthony Walton posed back in the late 90s about the emergence of technology design, not including black and, black and brown Americans, although black and brown Americans were prominent users of these technologies. Fast forward to today, we still see that there is a disconnect uh, with the current landscape of design, only seeing 7% Hispanic representation and 3% Black representation. And this comes from the 2016 um, AIGA design census. Um, and, and as you can see that the, the breakdown of those numbers, we're still seeing that there is a, 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 a huge um, uh, discrepancy in who is the majority in design um, and the tech spaces and who is still kind of minoritized. Well, why does this matter? Well, when we think about the lack of representation and inclusion in design and tech spaces, um, it oftentimes leads to design that doesn't consider the needs of all populations. Or um, in many instances, it leads to design that targets certain groups and is then uh, therefore harmful to their existence. Oftentimes, these lower numbers of, tech, of, of black and brown technologists and designers in the field, as well as in academic spaces, means that potential harm to black and brown communities is an afterthought. Instead of having someone in the room to say, hey, that's probably not a good idea, or that could turn out badly for people who we aren't thinking of, we end up with systems that disproportionately impact certain groups. Um, traditional methods of design, such as user-centered design or human-centered design have typically not considered these potential harms. And, and by these potential harms, I'm talking about things like system bias or lack of equity and access to digital resources, or more blatantly, um, racism, sexism, or other forms of oppression that can um, emerge in digital spaces, in search algorithms, in facial recognition software. And we're seeing firsthand what it means to not have diverse lived experiences that kind of conceptualize these ideas in tech and design spaces. Additionally, um, my work is motivated by how we actually think about black and brown communities in the research that we do. Uh, typically, when we think about black and brown communities in HCI and in design research, we realize that our research culture tends to focus on the problems that these communities face. Um, terms like marginalized or underserved are often used in place of just naming black and brown communities or black and brown neighborhoods, which causes us to then focus on the deficits and the disparities that these communities experience. Um, and, and many of us are guilty of this um, because it is so inherent in our research practice. Um, so this kind of brings me to conceptually, I, I like to think that my work challenges the ways that we think about technology access and the methods we use to expand that access. Technology access encompasses so much more than just physical and sensory accessibility, but also how inclusive products, spaces, and even design methods are to those who with varying values and lived experiences. A more equitable and inclusive design research culture calls for us to reconsider what methods are accessible. We're seeing more conversations about things like information equity and cultural competence. These conversations beg us to consider how design research is being conducted with individuals who have varying experiences with technology and how do we better reach those individuals? How do we consider more inclusive ways to go about design, which doesn't leave those who are already marginalized in society feeling ostracized or intimidated by our design practice or the, the, the products and technologies that come out of those design practices. 
So looking at my research approach, um, my work leans very heavily on participatory methods um, for the value of including people that are impacted by design within the practice of design itself. Um, many scholars and critical areas of design and HCI have begun a larger dialogue and rather an interrogation of what participation means um, in, in, in the context of design. So my work is actually concerned with equitable approaches to design participation that will reduce the harm on communities um, while also considering community priorities throughout the entirety of the design engagement. Um, for those who are not familiar, and, and I might be talking to a group that is, um, we know that previous literature in the uh, states that the value of participatory design um, is the ways that this method and, and design approach serves various groups of users that we don't readily consider in design. Um, literature also highlights that by involving these individuals as design contributors, we improve the likelihood of people adopting and using technology that is being developed um, instead of abandoning it um, after short periods of time, which, which we've seen in the past. Um, however, traditional participatory design still places the designer as the lead of a design engagement. Um, it creates power dynamics with designers ultimately making decisions in resources and materials and um, development um, and, and design contributors um, then kind of serve as just having contributed validation um, to what the designer is already planning to, to do. Um, when we think about kind of the contrast of that, as a methodological framework, um, community-based participatory research is a commonly used research technique um, that situates a particular community of individuals at the focus of the research. Um, it employs both knowledge sharing and activism as forms of health intervention. Um, and as we see in the diagram on the screen, um, maintaining that partnership um, is, is kind of the glue that holds this framework together. And by that partnership um, is defined as, you know, how we define the research agenda, how we go about um, doing the research, how we disseminate the outcomes, and kind of what is the mutual gain to the population or the community that we're working with. Um, we, we've, we've also started to see scholars that are concerned with research justice and liberatory research practices um, advocate for CBPR as a, as a research approach in other disciplines when engaging in community-based work. Um, again, to eliminate the harm of institutional research practices, particularly in communities that have been historically disenfranchised. So while the origins of participatory design, um, for, for uh, if you are not familiar, uh, participatory design has, you know, these Scandinavian origins um, in thinking about the future of work and organizational work. Um, and it was intended to bring about a certain level of democracy to the design practice. Um, what we've begun to see over the, the, the decades since um, kind of that in the inception of this, this approach um, is that uh, participatory design is now kind of laden with a certain level of corporate elitism. Um, this method has been packaged and monetized as an industry offering. Um, and it kind of comes with um, predefined goals. Um, and as I mentioned, looks to, to more validate a design direction than it does to work with a particular group um, to define what we're looking at. CBPR approaches to design urges us to think about the ways that we engage those outside of the academic institution or the, the, the industry company, um, how, how we engage those individuals in design and consider whose goals are we working towards and whose outcomes do we hold up as success. So a lot of what I've been doing is examining how we can better bridge uh, CBPR methodology into the ways that we think about design and engaging black and brown communities in design for several reasons. Um, the first, you know, situating design within community based participatory research uh, has been proven to help draw out values, priorities and experiences of a community. It also provides diverse perspectives on access to resources and what available platforms there are to position and advance community needs. 
but a lot of thought is needed into the ways that we do this such that again people do not feel intimidated or that they are the subject of some form of community outreach um, which is oftentimes the ways that it's kind of positioned when we talk about um, doing uh, hci and design research with marginalized groups um, in many instances this may require working within physical community settings in ways that are more natural to current organizing and mutual aid efforts in order to conceptualize both community and technology futures. So we're seeing now with projects like 51 Futures and the projects that are, uh, the images that I'm showing on this slide, um, the one on um, my left, uh, the, the left side of the screen uh, is an image of Boxville and 51 Futures, which was a community driven project that took place in the Bronzeville neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, Illinois, um, where uh, researchers and designers at the Illinois Institute of Technology kind of um, set up this space uh, to understand how um, residents of this neighborhood um, thought, you know, what they thought about the, the, the future of the Bronzeville corridor. Like, what does equity look like? What does, um, you know, the future of transportation look like? Um, and people were able to come up and kind of share their ideas um, and collectively envision um, what that looks like. So we're seeing with projects like 51 P Futures, or even the PAC project by Stephanie Dinkins, um, what it means to engage the Black community in conversations about technolo technological design. So this brings me to this area that I've been exploring, which examines the ways that we engage Black and Brown communities in the design process to speculate futures of technology or even community. How do we make this more equitable? How do we shift from traditional participatory methods to being more community-led and community-driven um, and considering what that means for those power dynamics that I talked about earlier? Um, so the project that I'm, I'm going to share is a project that was done in collaboration with Dr. Tawana Dillahunt at the University of Michigan, uh, where we conducted a series of speculative co-design workshops uh, as an approach to eliciting technology futures and looked at the ways we can both support the learning of design and digital skills while gaining insights um, about visions of technology among young adults. Uh, we chose to focus on the youth here instead of my previous work with older adults um, due to the impact of digital access on this population and the importance of considering their technology values in the larger conversation of digital literacy and speculating technology uh, futures. Um, so to just to contextualize, um, we consider participatory speculative design um, because of the ways that it situates communities to think about futures in a collective setting. Um, and among youth, this may be a way to not only consider newer realities, but to also potentially increase tech readiness and awareness. Uh, looking at the literature on speculative design across HCI, we find that it is discussed similarly to co-design or participatory design uh, as an inclusive method to engage populations like older adults in the consideration of technology futures. And this is has been done um, in the literature through things like storytelling, sketching, and creating design fictions. Whereas this work um, might have focused on age and health status, other identities such as class, race, or education um, were not considered. So borrowing from one of the tenets of critical race theory, which states that assumptions of white superiority are so ingrained in the political and legal structures that they are almost unrecognizable. And that we also, when we think about this normalization is often pervasive in technology um, and, and, and thus creates you know, harmful algorithms and other technologies that target certain groups, we identify that one of the gaps here is inclusive speculation uh, design methods that uh, as an approach to considering technology futures. So going into this study, we wanted to explore the following research questions, and I won't read these verbatim. I'll just leave them up on the screen for a couple of seconds here. Um, but we, we kind of went into this project um, with a couple of different goals of wanting to uh, understand um, inclusive conceptual frameworks that would resonate with Black and Brown communities, 
um, wanting to shift the approaches and methods um, to eliciting narratives to be more inclusive um, and to also elicit more inclusive uh, narratives of design futures themselves. Um, and so uh, we, we sought to identify um, the missing voices, understand approaches to eliciting more inclusive narratives, and to theoretically shift our design approaches and methods to being more inclusive within the design space. We, uh, over the course of the summer, we worked with a local arts engine, which is called the Arts Incubator, uh, which was established in 2013, um, actually by an artist by the name of Theaster Gates. Um, this arts and public life uh, incubator is located in the Washington Park neighborhood of Chicago, which is on the south side of Chicago. Um, and it, it, it's, it, its purpose or its intent is to serve as a catalyst for neighborhood revitalization and community engagement. Um, and so one of the initiatives of this arts engine is to expose south side Chicago youth to the arts and design um, through a program called the Design Apprenticeship Program. So we recruited six Black and Hispanic youth um, that were already enrolled in the Design Apprenticeship Program to engage in an additional weekly class. Um, so each week, um, the DAP youth were going to two classes. And so with our, our project, we added another class um, uh, during the week, uh, which would focus on speculative co-design and Afrofuturism. And we did this so that we could keep a similar format to how they were used to engaging with the DAP program. Um, and at the beginning of our workshops, students were given the prompt to consider the future of technology, as well as the future of the city of Chicago post pandemic, because this work was done um, over the course of the summer of 2020 uh, in the middle of the global health pandemic. Um, and so due to those circumstances, uh, these workshops were held remotely, which also allowed us to interrogate remote and virtual approaches to co-design engagements, as this is actually becoming a method that even outside of the confines of the pandemic is being explored um, as a method to expanding the access to design. So each week um, we showed different uh, clips of Black Mirror, um, the television show uh, that comes on Netflix um, it, or, or originates out of um, uh, uh, Britain, I believe, or the, or the UK. Um, and this is a, a television show um, that kind of talks about um, a, a dystopian uh, perspective of um, uh, the, the future of, of tech and, and how that positions um, different societal and, and what the, the potential societal implications are of that. And so we used these clips to kind of frame um, and situate um, youth to understand um, how technology might show up in the future um, and what those societal implications were. Uh, in addition to the mirrors, uh, the episodes of Black Mirror, we also developed a design guidebook um, to uh, elicit speculative design fictions among the DAP students. Um, and so each student was mailed out a, a guidebook um, prior to the beginning of the workshops um, that they could have and keep um, for themselves. And within this guidebook, we introduced um, different technology terms and different design concepts to understand like, well, what is participatory design and what is accessible design? What is inclusive design? Um, what is co-design? Um, and then we provided areas for them to document their ideas um, and spaces for ideation and brainstorming for them to respond to the prompt um, during our weekly sessions. I also want to, to mention and kind of contextualize that the design uh, workbook um, also incorporated elements of Afrofuturism um, in order to motivate design fictions and scenarios that lend to um, inclusive and impactful design futures. So this builds off of the work of um, scholars like Woodrow Winchester and Andre Brock. Um, Afrofuturism kind of situates us to provide a more empathetic design engagement when compared to traditional design approaches. Um, and it is a growing genre across media and literature, um, yet it, is, had, it has been relatively absent in the ways that we consider the futures of technology. So each week we started off introducing the youth to different concepts of design through the design guidebook and different types of technology 
through the Black Mirror clips and a tech glossary. We then walk them through each stage of the design process by engaging them and identifying various dystopian and utopian elements of their current environments. Um, we uh, guided them through speculating what a utopian future um, for themselves would look like, what a utopian future for the city of Chicago would look like, and then visually ideating those ideas through sketches and storyboards. Um, we spend a lot of time considering the design methods themselves, again, based on literature, which urges us to consider our presence and positionality within design workshop spaces. So, for example, one of the first things that kind of quickly came up was how tasking the virtual environment had become for students. Um, and so working with the DAP instructors that were also present in the workshops every week, um, we actually began to revamp how we engage students during the workshops to say maybe, you know, you know, you have the prompt, everyone can turn off their camera or even log off Zoom for 30 minutes while you're working in the design guidebook. And then we come back, we discuss, we kind of collaboratively um, revise our ideas and see where there's overlap. Um, and we kind of shift through that instead of doing longer extended um, periods of uh, co-design face-to-face -face over Zoom. So I wanna talk about our findings really briefly in two areas. The first being um, the realities of utopian and dystopian futures um, for the, the DAP youth that participated in our workshops. And then the value of Afrofuturism in engaging in collective speculation. Um, so in the earlier part of our design workshops, we engaged the DAP students in conversations about utopias and dystopias of their current reality. Um, what you're seeing in the image on the screen is one of the workbooks or one of one of the students workbooks um, where he actually identified um, Three of the challenges of dystopian reality that he identified were things like social class and some people having higher status than others, um, racism and discrimination and how it impacts people of color, and then poverty. Um, and there are, are people in this world with almost nothing and people struggle with getting money. So this stage of the, the design workshops was done to kind of set the stage of what a utopian future would need to consist of um, to kind of counterbalance um, elements of this dystopian reality. Reality. Um, and so youth identified that some of the elements that contributed to dystopian realities in the context of their personal lives and environment were things like unfair housing practices, non-livable wages, racism, and bigotry. Um, when students then went to identify what a utopia looked like for them, much of it centered on fairer treatment in society. Um, we find that uh, even when the students were prompted to envision, um, you know, just an imaginative future that had no bounds, you could think of anything, DAP students could not detach constructs of racism or poverty from their future realities. Utopian futures uh, for the students in the workshop looked like addressing existing social conditions in Chicago, such that there was less violence and poverty and that systems were more fair and equitable. Um, and this kind of brings us to interrogate the cultural hegemony of how we consider innovation within design spaces. How do we consider more equitable design imagining when certain groups are envisioning futures that look like fairness in everyday life? Um, and, and, and a lot a lot of us uh, take this for granted and, and are able to then be, um, you know, push, push the bounds of, of what we consider uh, imaginative uh, speculation. I also wanted to discuss the value of Afrofuturism as an approach to collective speculation. Um, so DAP students created collaborative storyboards and design fictions um, with each other um, that detailed their ideas for technologies to support their utopian futures. Um, and many of these design fictions and storyboards focused on addressing how black and brown communities could create their own solutions to societal conditions like climate change, homelessness, or even the pandemic. So what you're seeing in this slide um, is actually a storyboard that two of the youth um, collaboratively wrote together. Um, and then they wrote this design fiction um, that, that centered around these magical rings um, where um, uh, 
all someone had to do was to put on these rings and it would allow them to address any societal condition that they wanted to, um, such as, um, you know, cleaning up the ocean or even dealing with the pandemic. Um, and so the youth were able to, to, to write these design fictions with each other. Um, but what we found was that, um, you know, learning this through Afrofuturism, they were actually able to center themselves as the technologists, the scientists, the governmental leaders. Um, and, and what was so valuable about this was that, um, you know, unlike other engagements of, of co-design, the youth here were actually talking about themselves as these scientists or inventors. Um, students even commented on how learning about the, con the concepts of Afrofuturism and engaging with it throughout our workshops allowed them to see themselves in the designs of their futures or Chicago's futures. We also found from this work that leveraging Afrofuturism as a conceptual framework, uh, youth were able to pick up on the different design and technology concepts, which has great implications for digital literacy and the ways that we think about um, creating tools um, and, and probes to support digital literacy. So coming out of this, these workshops um, kind of allowed us to consider several implications for um, speculative uh, co-design being more inclusive. Um, the first being the merit in Afrofuturism as a lens for speculating future technologies. The second being the benefits to having various design fiction probes um, throughout a co-design engagement. Um, and the third being the value of the design workbooks themselves. Um, and just to reiterate, the design workbooks um, kind of proved to be a, a very helpful uh, design probe uh, because it allowed youth the flexibility of how they interacted in the workshop space. Um, them having these guidebooks, they were able to um, document their ideas outside of the, the two hours that we met weekly um, if, if students had to work or take care of families. They were still able to engage um, in the work, but uh, in the workshops and come back with their ideas, um, you know, even if they could not stay for the, the full time um, that we met face to face each week. So our work presents both empirical and methodological contributions to the field of design and HCI. Um, as I stated earlier, our goal was to elicit more inclusive design fictions as a way to understand how those who are historically disenfranchised envision the future of technology. Um, our study here represents um, an, an understanding of elements that speak to visions of utopias for Black and Hispanic youth. And additionally, we make the methodological contribution of presenting a critical reflection on the ways Black and Brown youth contribute to technology futures by looking at methods um, and design probes that promote inclusion as well as self-identification. Um, so kind of thinking about, well, where do we go from here? A little bit of the work um, that I'm doing um, kind of branching off of, of these uh, speculative co-design workshops um, based on a few of the implications that stood out from that project. Um, number one uh, being thinking about the contrasting realities that certain groups face when thinking about speculative futures, um, considering how do we frame futuring and speculation such that it's inclusive and equitable, uh, particularly if there are some groups who are uh, envisioning things like livable wages and fair housing practices and anti-racism, anti-racist systems, um, you know, where is there space for true radical imagination and innovation? Um, and how can design provide balance there? Um, so I mentioned earlier that one of the things I'm really interested in is how do we push beyond traditional methods of participatory design as more than just a validation exercise, kind of moving from, you know, designing for to designing with to ultimately relinquishing power in design such that individuals are able to design without the presence of academic researchers. Um, and the last consideration being um, in thinking about the ways that um, we consider and, and position our thoughts as HCI and design researchers um, around black and brown communities in our, in our design research work. What does it mean to consider just everyday existence of uh, many of these communities without framing them as problems to be solved? Um, 
So to address these areas, one of the things I'm currently working on uh, is envisioning tools that support um, community ownership of design futures. Um, right now we are exploring a speculative design toolkit, which uses Afrofuturism as a lens to engage people in collectively thinking about futures, um, and not necessarily just technology futures or the future of computing systems, but also the future of spaces that speak to collectivism, um, the future of design as a social practice, and ultimately what that means for, for more people to have access to design. Um, we've chosen to use this Afrofuturist lens and aesthetic here um, to promote inclusion uh, and communities being able to see themselves reflected in not just the aesthetic of design, but also in the ways that topics are considered. So within this toolkit, we've considered um, kind of uh, several different card decks that would walk um, community practitioners through a co-design engagement starting with a topics card which is seen as the green card you know if we wanted to address environmental racism but considering it from a lens of how do we think about um, moments when we feel free right so that's kind of providing that balance um, of not just identifying the problem but also um, counterbalancing that with the value um, uh, of of the the black lived experience um, and then thinking about the methods and potentially the solution building that we'd be doing um, and framing that through are we thinking about a year in the future, five years in the future, 10 years in the future. Um, and this kind of becoming a, an exercise that community pr practitioners could use um, to kind of walk someone through um, a design engagement. This also looks like creating tools and resources for those who are interested in engaging in design who might not be as familiar with design. So this is a zine that was created by my lab um, as a way to support people interested in engaging in community driven participatory design. Um, we actually interviewed um, over 33 community practitioners um, and surveyed over 100 people that kind of had some type of touch point to doing design work. Um, and we created this zine of best practices and themes and guiding principles of thinking about community driven um, co design um, and, and provide and created just this free online resource um, of uh, a community driven participatory design zine, which is actually available on the EHI website. So I would like to thank um, my community partners for their collaboration, the external front funding sources that have supported my work, as well as my colleagues and department at DePaul for their mentorship and would open the floor to any questions. <laughs>